Hello everybody, I'm Jake from Jams and Tea, and today I'm going to be talking about the discography of one of my favorite artists, Japanese composer and general musical maestro, Susumu Hirasawa. In the past, myself and my friends here on the channel have often done solo videos about bands and artists whose work mean a lot to us, but generally speaking, those bands and artists are fairly beloved and popular by avid fans and regular music listeners alike. So to switch things up, I'm talking about someone on the more obscure end of the gradient. While this is going to function as a typical discography ranking like we've done in the past, more than usual, I want this to serve as a guide for people who maybe don't know much about Mr. Hirasawa here's work. To be blunt, his body of work and general influence in the world of electronic music, art pop, and composition goes supremely understated in the modern musical climate. And I love these records so much that I will do anything in my power to fix that. So, regardless of whether or not you're a fan, or whether or not you've even heard of Susumu Hirasawa before, rest easy, because either way, this video is for you. If you're at all familiar with Hirasawa, it's more than likely that it's through his work soundtracking popular anime series and films, notably the 1997 adaptation of Kentaro Miura's Berserk, and several collaborations with the late great Satoshi Kon, as Hirasawa scored his series Paranoia Agent, as well as films like Paprika and Millennium Actress. Which, if you haven't seen, I implore you to seek those out, as not only do they have incredible music, they are glorious works in and of themselves. If you're at all familiar with his style, Hirasawa tends to blend an incredibly eclectic combination of synth and electro-pop, orchestral arrangements, glitch, and IDM into a positively incredible singular style that makes his distinct sound absolutely unmistakable. But beyond the realms of his fantastic soundtrack work lies something more vast, ethereal, and to a certain degree, indescribable. I'm certainly not advocating to overlook his work scoring various anime, as I think it is as essential as supplementary material can possibly be but his proper studio discography is where the real magic lies. Do you enjoy the impressive, ambitious, genre-defying art pop of someone like Björk? Do you enjoy the dense, overwhelming, new-age wall of sound bliss often employed by people like Devin Townsend? Are you a fan of artists like Aphex Twin, The War on Drugs, Peter Gabriel, or Kate Bush? Well, then I have great news for you, because you're probably about to become a fan of Susumu Hirasawa. Born in 1954, Hirasawa's list of musical accomplishments is vast. Not only does he have a solo discography and soundtrack work, he initially started in the world of music as a part of prog rock band called Mandrake, but ultimately pursued music to a more successful end in the Japanese new wave band called P-Model, a group worthy of their own more focused discussion that took from bands like Kraftwerk and Yellow Magic Orchestra, which is to say, just because I'm only going to focus on his studio discography in 1989 does not mean that this is the limit of his work or influence. I say this not just for the sake of clarity, but to give the impression that this guy has been prolific and accomplished for decades, and thus is as musically gifted and storied as someone with his reputation implies. If you enjoy anything here, I highly recommend seeking out not only his tertiary stuff, but his live releases, side projects, and various remix albums where he constantly updates older arrangements and compositions with a new coat of paint. Now, without further ado, let's discuss. Number 14, 13, and 12. Science no Yure, Jiku no Mizu, and Virtual Rabbit. Now, the worst part about making videos with this format is that you inevitably must begin at whatever you consider to be an artist's least flattering or least essential work. And since my goal here is to introduce this music to a new potential audience, it's not the best look to just lump three records into this bottom spot. However, I don't do it without purpose. Jiku no Mizu, Virtual Rabbit, and Science no Yure are the three albums that kick-started Hirasawa's solo career, a trilogy of records I view as being very of a piece with one another. The most obvious reason these albums are here is because I think that even huge fans will probably tell you that, within the context of Hirasawa's career arc, they are observably very transitional. You can feel the influence of his work with P-Model looming very large over these, and honestly, that's the biggest deciding factor in regards to how much you're actually going to get along with these. While while there is certainly a more driving, atmospheric vibe to the sound being formed here, the Yellow Magic Orchestra adjacent sound is something that feels only slightly elaborated upon here. There are quirky, more evident signs of Hirasawa's developing idiosyncrasies burgeoning on here, most notably the influences of Zolo derivative acts like Cardiacs and Oingo Boingo, and honestly, it all works very well. From the get-go, Hirasawa has a very tight grasp on song construction and melody, and his singing voice since day one 
one has been a godly presence that feels like a divine ray of light, language barrier be damned. These are all tight affairs that never outstay their welcome, but I think my issue with them runs deeper than finding them to be rudimentary when compared to the sounds he's explored later on. Most of Hirasawa's distinct strengths as an artist are things that he would grow into, so it's less that these aren't as good as his other stuff, and more that they're just the least emblematic of what he would become. This sound is certainly more skeletal and elemental, but there's still a distinct beauty in it that separates him from his contemporaries. I should stress that all of these albums are good, but I can't say that there's much to differentiate them from one another. I do think that the debut, Jiku no Mizu, is probably the most consistent of the three, so if you want a dose of where Hirasawa started, that would probably be where I would start. However, I can't really label these as essential listens, and personally, the music this draws from has a bit of a ceiling for me anyway, so your mileage will vary. It's a bit like starting with the early days of Fleetwood Mac. It's kind of difficult to recommend the band off of anything that was released before Buckingham and Nyx joined. Not because it isn't good, but because it's not why you'd go to an artist like that in the first place. But for completionists and for those who are curious, these three albums are delightful artifacts that, while certainly indebted to their influences, bring enough to the table to be worthwhile. Just maybe don't start here unless you are very, very committed to exploring this discography as a whole. Number 11, Planet Roll Call. Now we're jumping from the very start of Hirasawa's career to the beginning of what I think I would consider to be the final phase of his sound, and I can also start to throw around praise with much fewer qualifications. As a matter of fact, the rest of this list, including this entry, is entirely comprised of albums I would consider to be, at minimum, great. While its somewhat rocky start and the intro track and title track landed a few spots lower than some of the albums he'd go on to make later, Planet Roll Call is a full embrace of Hirasawa's incorporation of full-on orchestral arrangements into his distinctly fluid yet artificial sound. Gone are the glitch inclinations of White Tiger Field, and instead we have him channeling the bombast of his film work being structured and fit tightly into a proper album format. Highlights like Royal Road, Paradise, and Visible Sea showcase just how dynamic Hirasawa's become at this season stage in his career. Exploring murky ambience on the latter and atmospheric wonder that devolves into gnarly rhythmic guitar solo filled opulence on the former. I think that what surprised me the most about his newer records is the ever-increasing influence of techno and dance music, which is certainly here more than it ever has been, but I wouldn't say it's a coherent musical idea that's fully developed, and more of an accent that adds a little flavor. If the album has any faults that land any lower on this list other than the somewhat underwhelming beginning, it too feels like a bit transitional and far less distinct than basically anything before or even after it. This is an everything-in-the-kitchen-sink kind of album, and while I respect the ambition, particularly when it comes to the wall-of-sound pop maximalism that Hirasawa is more typically associated with, I think he would go on to refine this a bit more coherently, as the orchestration and electronic elements never clash, but they do keep the record from retaining a kind of unity that feels pretty essential to his other albums. While I wouldn't prioritize this, I would certainly say that it's best to start here and work your way through his newer stuff chronologically, just because you really see him work through the kinks of this more all-encompassing assembly of science fiction-tinged awe, and create what I would argue is much stronger, more organized versions of this very ambitious sound. Like on... Number 10. Gensho no Hana no Himitsu. Immediately after Planet Roll Call, we get a more satisfying, holistic, slick incarnation of where Hirasawa found himself headed near the turn of the decade. The wide array of sounds across his entire career are now found in one album that, while not dramatically better than its older sibling, I think inarguably just has a better head on its shoulders, so to speak. If the intro was where the previous album stumbled a bit, here the relatively underwhelming outro is what kind of lets it down. 
but everything that precedes that is so excellent and well put together that its minor flaws are even more easy to overlook. While this record tends to not have the raw excitement and experimentation of his earlier work, what you get traded for the various highs is a sense of consistent artistic confidence that's rarely seen with even music's most established veterans. Take something like Track 3, The Shadow of Bloom, which blends squalling synth tones with dramatic strings to create something tense and anxious in a way that Hirasawa's work has rarely been up until this point, or track 5, Zalanero the Thief, that begins with a campy string and horn arrangement that makes something more reminiscent of neoclassical darkwave music from the 80s, but with a guided, elegant melody that feels effortless. This album's best moments don't burst with color or verve like the best of his material does, but it remains just as, if not more, intriguing if you're willing to interrogate it. Not an immediate record, but one I think rewards the listener substantially if you're willing to put in the time. Number 9. Beacon I think one of the most underappreciated things about Hirasawa is the sheer length of his career arc, particularly when you account for consistency. For all intents and purposes, his most recent project at the present, 2021's Beacon, has absolutely zero right being as great as it is. The techno and dance influences I mentioned that were beginning to rear their heads on Planet Roll Call have now found themselves fully manifested here, and Hirasawa takes a late career left turn to make a record that feels so full of life fun and eccentricity that it almost feels like a callback to his earliest stuff, just done with confidence and ambition that 20 years worth of experience affords you. Right off the bat, from the thick, dueling synth tones of the second track and synthetic drum beat and guitars, you can tell that this is going to be a much different feel from what was closely preceded it on other records. The actual ways in which the instrumental ideas intersect and often combat one another here feels deliberately antagonistic, which makes the atmospheric final leg feel all the more liberating. He may be leaning into his strangest tendencies as an artist on here, but make no mistake, every decision here is made with careful purpose. It just may not be immediately evident. In many respects, that makes this comparable to Björk's most recent crop of more diverse records, but thankfully on here, Susumu still has has a bedrock of traditional songs that make you feel right at home, that sort of buoy the album away from totally uncharted waters. This may be his most rawly fun record in years, but I would also say it's perhaps his most challenging, which I guess make it a perfect analog for Fasora in a lot of respects, both spiritually and sonically, as both feel like melody takes a backseat to pulsating rhythms that, while never absent from their respective artists' back catalog, were never as confidently capitalized upon until now. This is certainly one to save for the end of your theoretical Hirasawa deep dive, but not because it's lesser, merely more difficult to parse to the untrained ear, as once you're more familiar, you'll be throwing ass to this like you would from someone like one of Hirasawa's biggest influences, that of Sparks. If you're at all into their Lil' Beethoven era of music, you'll not find yourself more at home than with something like Beacon. Number 8. Aurora Now, granted, Hirasawa is not a hugely popular artist, though the internet has given a second life to many artists that would have gone criminally underrated like Hirasawa, but amongst people who would consider themselves to be fans of his music, I think that my placement of 1994's Aurora here may be the most objectionable take I have in this discography. If you haven't guessed by the previous entries, I've got no shortage of praise to heap on these records regardless of placement, so bear with me on this one. Aurora, by most accounts, is the records I think most fans will tell you either got them into Hirasawa's music or is just straight up their favorite of his catalog. And believe me, I get why. Aurora is the first proper solo album where his signature sound really feels like it's been found and captured. The departure from traditional new wave into ambient art and synth pop mixed with dreamy atmospheric washes of digital sound is truly something to behold, and also becomes the precise moment where you can appreciate how absolutely incredible his work has aged. From the stunning opener and fan-favorite Stone Garden, which features Hirasawa's soaring vocals, an aspect of his performance that feels beautiful from the get-go and simply never drops in quality, alongside a sparse but textured instrumental that's combined to incredible effect to feel shockingly titanic. The guitar solo at the end nearly has me in tears, capturing a sense of power, but also a sense of exploratory wonder that hints at just why this music is so great. 
It legitimately feels as though you're entering a world full of colors that you've never seen before and can barely describe. The fact that anything lives up to this on the album is a miracle, let alone the very next track, Love Song, which shows the influence of ethereal wave music, coupled with the fantastically fragile performance from Hirasawa showcasing phenomenal versatility. The magic of Aurora is simply found in abundance on every song. In my eyes, it doesn't quite hit these titanic heights again until the penultimate track, the 13 minute long opus that is Paranesian Circle, a glacial ambient pop meditation that explodes into something far more ambitious and transcendent in its final segment, which is a thrilling way to end the album, but it does mean that the record settles for a great stretch of songs in the midsection that doesn't quite compete with the stratospheric bookends. But it would be a little silly of me to really hold that against the album in any legitimate capacity. If anything, Aurora is the first definitive statement from Hirasawa that signals the beginning of a run of records that I promise will rival any one of your favorite artists at their peak. When it comes to entries in his discography, I think Aurora here is a solid pick because it gives you a taste of what makes these records great, but at the same time, there's room for improvement here that gets satisfyingly elaborated upon with other records so you aren't spoiling yourself with the absolute peak of his work from the outset, which could further incentivize you to explore more. Though I suppose many might disagree with me there. I just know that when I recommend any body of work from a musician, I don't necessarily start with what I consider to be their peak, because the rest of their records could run the risk of underwhelming you. And I feel as though the more informed on minor works of a given artist you are, the more you'll appreciate their highs. Thankfully, Mr. Hirasawa has too many great records for that to be a big problem. I say all this mainly to assure you, if you listen to Aurora and feel as though it doesn't fully captivate you, there's plenty more to dig into. But still, this is a record that contains no shortage of wonderful moments. Number 7. The Man Climbing the Hologram if you listen to only one of the records from Hirasawa's recent crop of albums, you should probably make it this one. Really, it's just for one reason. Consistency. I think of all of his 2010s records, this is the most well-realized vision. The glitchier inclinations of his previous records finally feel as though it's a real present element of the record, and generally speaking, the rough edges of something like Planet Roll Call are smoothed over, making a more cohesive, larger-than-life sound that sacrifices very little to achieve its aforementioned consistency. I will say that of his great records, it is probably the least risky, as it does do a lot more refining than outright innovating, which is a rarity with Hirasawa, but overall I think that's way more of a benefit than a hindrance. Tracks like album highlights Muramasa alternate between almost industrial metallic bits of percussion, sharp synthesizers, and brass orchestration that creates a whirlwind around Hirasawa's vocals. And that's kind of the modus operandi here for the whole thing. Everything feels like a storm ebbing and flowing around the central conceit of relying on one of his biggest and oldest strengths, his knack for vocal hooks. And lest we forget the frequent implementation of distorted, gnarled, scuzzy guitars to bridge the gap between larger sections of the tracks, until he combines disparate segments that will occasionally harmonize together in unexpected ways. Once again, later Hirasawa is a bit more challenging than his other stuff. If you insist on exploring this part of his career in your dive, I would probably recommend listening to something like Beat first, but to me, this is the album with the most staying power. Number 6, Blue Limbo. This, to me, is when we go from talking about albums that are great and supremely underheard, to being albums that, for all intents and purposes, should be considered canonical, standard-bearing milestones for creative synth-pop and electronic music. Blue Limbo here might be Hirasawa's most adventurous outing when compared to what immediately preceded it, as just about every isolated element feels like it's pushing the boundaries of his 90s sound. Just listen to the cut-up, nearly incoherent guitars on something like Ride the Blue Limbo, and how they're flawlessly woven into the song's progression. While the opener, the stunning grandfatherly wind, is a sublime taste of what fans would expect, Everything from then on is a 
total left turn. Even the vocal performances on here, while certainly no less beautiful or powerful, are imbued with a sense of camp and melodrama that he simply hasn't harnessed before. This album really has it all, from trip-hop excursions to more purely ornate orchestral bits, and what it lacks in cohesion it makes up for being one of the most colorful and well-balanced albums of its kind. And when you consider what a huge step forward is for him as an artist, stepping out of his comfort zone, that's kind of a minor miracle that it doesn't totally fall on its face. This is, yet again, another example of an album you absolutely shouldn't start with, but this is also the point on the list where everything should be considered absolutely mandatory listening. It deserves to be properly built up to so you can appreciate what a refreshing left turn it is, even though it hardly abandons its core strengths as a record that holds all of the same appeal that other records of his do. Just don't expect it to hit immediately if this is one of the first things you listen to. Number 5. The Philosopher's Propeller While well, certainly considered an upper-rung release, and what proved beyond the shadow of the doubt that just because his stellar 90s run of records was over didn't mean he was done making excellent music, I find that this album is just criminally underheard. Why? I chalk it up to general obscurity because this album fucking rips. I mean, of course it does, it wouldn't make the top five if it didn't, but to me, Philosopher's Propeller is an album that deserves special emphasis because it resides comfortably between the two most significant and obviously distinguishable eras of Hirasawa's music. You could lobby the critique that this album is transitional, but like I often say, that's a neutral term. And an album can often benefit from this conflicting status as often as it can be hurt by it. Immediately with the opener and title track, you get the glorious mission statement of the album with its enormous string orchestration and cavernous vocals, a blend of human and digital sounds that feels as though these singular elements are at their most contrasting, but never to this album's detriment. The actual arrangements and Really, some of the aesthetics actually remind me of compositional wonderkind Joe Saishi, a man whose peerless work with the beloved films of Studio Ghibli has no doubt played some role here, as often these songs feel like larger, synth-driven attempts at evoking things like Castle in the Sky, Nausicaa of the Valley of the Wind, or Princess Mononoke. The woodwinds on a track like Negretto are recognizable and wonderful that feel very much like they're drawing from this palette. There's as much heartbreak as there is wonder on this record. The mournful piano melodies on albedo, the mysterious and downright ominous quality of quadrature de circles is frequently chilling, which is impressive given how many moving parts are in this song. It feels as though it borders on losing the grip that it has on its tone, but it never actually does. The frequent tribal vocal samples across this record also give it a real sense of place and definition, adding to the litany of records in this discography that feel as though they evoke worlds as much as sounds. While I do think Albedo is a great track, it does feel comparatively minimal on this record that's so heavy on atmosphere, and I find that it disrupts its otherwise gorgeous flow, but that's genuinely its only true weakness. It's a bit of an outlier here because of its peculiar placement in his timeline of releases, but that becomes less of an obstacle and more of the whole appeal of this record, as its ethereal but distinctly earthy qualities make it feel grounded in a way that some of his other best albums aren't. And thus, this contrasting status of different colliding sounds and eras make it one of his most singular releases. Number 4. Technique of Relief If you've heard or heard of any single record from Hirasawa's solo career, that single record is most likely Technique of Relief. Both his most popular and his most acclaimed, this album is held in high esteem by basically everyone that's heard it, and would more than likely be willing to be put alongside anything within the larger art, pop, and electronic music canon, and deservedly so. It's a masterful piece of work, from the triumphant and soaring opener Town Zero Phase 5, which beautifully showcases just how well Hirasawa Hirasawa's production style is held up with its bright keyboard and synth work, to the song immediately after, the wondrous and textured futuristic ballad Moon Time. This album showcases the incredible sense of dynamics Hirasawa has on his best projects. The sparkling acoustic chords in the former being one of my favorite singular moments in his discography. And from there, you're in for an all-killer experience. 
I think part of the reason this has stayed comfortably at the top of his records when it comes to its reputation, besides, you know, general excellence, is that every song lets you explore a different, very specific facet of the artist behind it. Be they high-velocity bangers like the opener, industrial-tinged mid-tempo meditations like Bridge Builder, or atmospheric ambient pop moments of bliss like the sublime Ghost Bridge. Everything is essential, self-contained, but never strays too far from the core of his aesthetic to feel disparate or jarring. To me, if I can continue writing with the light Bjork comparisons, this feels like his equivalent of Post, where he's outgrown his nation stage and potential growing pains, and fully commits to painting as big of a portrait as possible, presenting a sound that feels like it's bound to nothing but his own whim. It's not a weakness of the album by any means, but the comparative lack of steadfast commitment is probably what keeps it from topping my own personal ranking just outside the top three. It's also this very quality that probably makes it a favorite from everyone else. It's a versatile, jack-of-all-trades affair that isn't a terrible place to start, even if it might feel as though it renders earlier records like Aurora somewhat less significant upon first listen, just because of how confident and assured this all is. So, if you don't mind spoiling yourself and you want to see what all Hubbub is about, this will undoubtedly showcase why Hirasawa has developed the cult following that he has. Nothing on here even approximates a miss, and even if it's not my favorite, plenty of artists will, to be blunt, never make an album even half this good. If the distorted guitar tones at the end of Ghost Bridge don't send electricity down your spine, or if the man from Narcissus Space doesn't make you feel like you're looking down at Earth through the window of some kind of alien spacecraft, then, frankly, I don't want to know. Number 3. Sim City. The top three is where we're really getting into the weeds here when it comes to just how utterly phenomenal these records are, both as holistic musical experiences and when it comes to just how utterly impressive they all are. While obviously not the top slot of this list, I think Sim City may be Hirasawa's most rawly impressive and conceptual work. This was the first proper album I heard from him, and as such, I don't really know what I expected to hear, but it was not the all-out assault of the opener archetype end the way the drums sound on this song and across this whole album really feels utterly impossible. You simply cannot get drums to sound this big, be they programmed or analog, and I legitimately don't understand how this was accomplished. The vocal hook on this is both catchy and deeply operatic, and every instrumental element in the mix just feels like it couldn't have been made by human hands. The proper New Agey elements of his sound have been there since the start, but Sim City feels like the first time it's utilized in such a way that it melds and enhances the other parts of his sound, rather than just being a disparate aspect within a sea of vast influences. Everything here is so deep, so full, so epic feeling that it feels as though the mp3 format can barely withhold its power. This whole record is actually a pseudo-concept record about a futuristic Thailand a thousand years in the future, and draws a lot of its lyrical themes from this grand metropolis-style utopia, so the tone of this whole thing is both triumphant and full of awe. Hirasawa is never a slouch when it comes to vocal hooks, but on here it's just a relentless assault and the way he dynamically just kind of shoves them into your brain through brute force is something that could be tedious, but simply feels right at home within this continuously beautiful, massive work. The influences of Asian folk music and classical Thai music, this wonderful combination adding to an already brimming set of established styles, occasionally evokes things like Gaino Yamashiragumi's similarly progressive and deeply memorable score to Akira. This not only showcases Hirasawa's lingering interests in science fiction, but feels as though this particular facet is blown up and can be tangibly felt that it's strong here, a key aspect of his sound that'll continue to grow going forward. This is more key than I think a lot of people might realize, as his willingness to evoke not just soundscapes and emotions, but entire worlds unto themselves it just gets bigger and bigger from here on out. This album holds all the pop appeal of his other work, but does genuinely make you feel like you're in this vast, intricate future that the human mind can barely perceive. Take songs like the beloved 
Pacific Rim Imitation Network, the moment on the album that I think coalesces everything Hirasawa has been doing, not just on this record, but really his whole career up until this point. This blend of folk and electronica, his soaring vocals, the beautiful piano passage midway through, and the absolutely filthy guitar solo all inside one three and a half minute long song. It rides the line between cogent enough to process, but big enough to make you feel microscopic. One of the biggest factors in this album's construction was actually an attempt on behalf of Hirasawa to make a Japanese equivalent to Pink Floyd's Dark Side of the Moon. And for what it's worth, Mr. Hirasawa was not only inspired by just the experiences he had in Thailand and his other musical influences, but has cited specifically his friendships with and appreciation for the subcultures of the trans community in Thailand as being pivotal in the construction of this album, as several trans women supposedly have vocal features on this record. The leaps and bounds made between this and Aurora, an album that came out only one year prior, is staggering, but proves to me that Aurora really was an effective exercise of inventing his own musical language, whereas here, he uses that language to create a story. This album may have enamored me as my own personal introduction to his music, but it's also a lot. So on one hand, I do think this is Hirasawa's first proper masterpiece, and it's hard to go wrong there. On the other hand, it's definitely an album that feels better informed by Aurora which further emphasizes that I think anyone doing a deep dive into these albums should basically start there and continue chronologically through his golden run and then maybe be more selective afterwards. While dense and conceptual, SimCity is the first real window we get into the potential this artist possesses as someone who is not hindered by his ambitions and fully intends to capitalize on them. Welcome to the trans-utopia. Number two. White Tiger Field. It may be because of my comparatively early exposure to a version of this song that appears within the score to Satoshi Kon's Paprika, but the album Hirasawa made alongside the release of that film, 2006's White Tiger Field, contains the original version of that film's opening credit sequence, the song Meditational Field. On this record, we see the song's original form in the title track, which is, in my opinion, the single most beautiful piece of music Hirasawa has ever made. From the moment it starts with a glistening set of harp strings, a small musical idea that I am nevertheless utterly in love with and fascinated by, even though it is a microscopic four second long progression, to its glitch pop vocal refrains, bouncy beat, gorgeous string flourishes, and seamless layering of each of these ideas one after the other, I simply never tire of this piece. It's brimming with childlike wonder, joy, and perhaps a key element to this album's identity, eccentricity. I won't pretend like this is Hirasawa's most accessible work, as it's probably the glitchiest, most fully electronic in nature, and thus prioritizes unity within its vast digital aesthetic above the raw impact of past albums. However, this leads to maybe the most solidly built well-balanced album in his whole catalog. In my opinion, this is a bit of a revamp of the world of ideas he explored on albums like Technique of Relief, but with an added decade's worth of growth as an artist. And you can hear that in every song. The full versions of the two prominent tracks from Paprika, the title track and the equally godlike closer, Parade, still showcase Hirasawa at his most singular and colorful. Every track here shimmers and pops with uncanny vocal samples and a litany of different synth tones. Take the third track, the haunting and dystopian The Stillborn City, a diverse array of electronic instruments like bagpipes, organs, and choir vocals create something that sounds like the compositional work of Kenji Kawai, who you probably know for his excellent work with the Ghost in the Shell score. Even then, the track still drifts into a melody-driven valley of contrast with the bagpipes clashing against Hirasawa's incredibly passionate vocal refrains. Even in the tracks here that could be classified as comparatively more one-dimensional, contain within them so much depth. This is Hirasawa's most 
forward-looking work. Even if his records after it explore unprecedented territory, this set the stage for that exploration in the first place. So much of this album feels downright unknowable, and it just feels like exploring a digitized universe all its own. And I have lost many hours just feeling absolutely immersed within it. Like the movie he worked on concurrently with this, it does feel like a dream drenched in layers of science fiction and film. It does have moments that slow down, occasionally relying on more traditional bits of orchestration that feel seamlessly tied into this immense sound palette. Even still, this is easily some of his most structurally and sonically dynamic work. And while I can confidently rank it among his best, I can absolutely say that this is best enjoyed once you have some familiarity with him. However, once you get a handle on that, I think you may find this to be his most rewarding work as it probably is his best record since the turn of the century. His most outwardly eclectic album just happens to be one of his absolute best, with highlights that any fan will latch on to. A world of bombastic alien beauty awaits any listener who properly readies themselves for this titanic experience. Number 1. Siren One of the more beloved albums in this discography, Siren may not have the popularity of Technique of Relief or Aurora, but I think that's because this record is just so immediately... overwhelming. The multifaceted sounds and styles of other high-tier Hirasawa albums allow them a degree of accessibility to new listeners, as they can compartmentalize each of the genre dalliances and switch-ups when it comes to those records' respective sense of dynamism. Even on White Tiger Field, there's enough room to breathe so that you never feel like the momentum of the record gets away from you. Siren, on the other hand, is like staring into the sun. From the absolutely stunning proper opener all the way to its properly climactic ending with Mermaid Song, Siren is a straightforward sensory overload. Hirasawa's brand of maximalism turned up to its most intense, most energized, and in my opinion, most wholly captivating. That's not to say that this record doesn't contain a vast array of contrast within itself. It is never one-dimensional. Take a look at the two-track sequence together on here. The absolutely planet-shaking, titanic banger that is Day Scanner. Hirasawa at his most rhythmically satisfying and aggressive with what immediately follows it in the form of Siam Lights, a song that immerses you in languorous vocal melodies and synths so fast it feels as though it could devour the known universe. A song that bears uncanny similarities to the closer Mermaid on Sade's Love Deluxe, a beguiling but nonetheless enticing combination of sounds. Yet, the common factor linking these two very opposing tracks is the sweeping sense of scope one key element that this album never loses sight of. The best comparison I can think of for the appeal of this album, spiritually, sonically, artistically, is Björk's Homogenic. Just replace the strings with synth tones and you've got a very similar experience. Hell, the opener and title track feel as though this could be considered Hirasawa's Yoga, an idiosyncratic melody woven into a dreamy backdrop that's accented by this enormous, immensely satisfying crunchy drum beat that just never gets old. The sense of elemental simplicity in these tracks is easy to break down and understand, but it still feels as though it contains something mysterious and even alien at its heart that I find so alluring and transfixing. These things don't make it devoid of immediacy either. Nurse Cafe is this swirling, singularly joyous piece of music that's glitchy, melodious, and hard-hitting all at once. Listening to Siren is like being exposed to this otherworldly cosmic light that feels as though the human senses weren't meant to comprehend it. Every isolated instrumental idea feels as though it's stretched to its least recognizable point, to the extent where I find many of the tones and timbres of Hirasawa's 90s and 2000s stuff, particularly this and White Tiger Field, may have inadvertently predicted the entire aesthetic of things like hyperpop, I feel as though the DNA is almost inextricably linked to these records. Track after track on every single song, Siren never fails to give you something new. And it may be the most purely joyous pop album I've ever heard. If SimCity was the projection of a bright, futuristic city through music, then Siren is the sound of unadulterated emotional elation. 
There are few records that put me in as good of a mood as Siren does, as it's the apex of Hirasawa's style and appeal, concentrated into a timeless, beautifully aged, progressive synth-pop masterpiece, as well as a profoundly affecting artistic statement in ways I genuinely haven't experienced before in all of my years of obsessively consuming music. Originally, I was just going to do this ranking and leave it at that, but honestly, as the days went by, I was less and less satisfied with that. Hirasawa deserves my all, and as much effort and time as we put into videos like this, I wanted to do more. If I really wanted to sell this artist and his music to people, I had to go beyond assessments and rankings and even details on where you should start. What is it about Hirasawa's music that captivates me as thoroughly as it does? Why do I adore his work so much? Other than being a cutting-edge, prolific, deeply underrated musician, what is it that makes the music go the extra mile to the point of where I would consider it to be canonical to my personal taste in music and art? If I may briefly speak a bit more candidly than we tend to in videos like this, I think it's difficult to convey just how deeply ingrained music and this YouTube channel have become into my everyday life. We've been making weekly content regularly for three years now, and if you're a long-time viewer or have tuned in to specific episodes of our show, you'll know that we tend to get very emotional with resonant art. Perhaps a bit too emotional, sometimes. And, you know, that's a funny thing. When I think about art and what I've said about Hirasawa's music, not a lot of it is directly emotional or super resonant in the way that art I gravitate to often is. It contains lots of nuanced emotions, beautifully and uniquely communicated, sure, but it's not exactly like music that I listen to and connect with on the same stuff I traditionally do, like Frightened Rabbit or Porcupine Tree. If anything, Hirasawa's music is an antidote to a lot of what I typically engage with. It's not as though it's one-dimensional or skin-deep, but it's one of those instances where its antithetical existence makes it refreshing. I often find deep, profound catharsis in music that acknowledges and addresses very challenging, very emotionally fraught concepts that feel almost intimidating in how dour they can often be, and that's fine. That art has its place, but that's also why I relish connecting with a discography like Hirasawa's. It reminds me that I don't need to constantly remind myself of painful things in art to have a revelatory or impactful experience. The singularity, the vision, the scope, the awe of art is such a rare and valuable thing, and it's more than enough to connect with that. I've had such a difficult time this last year. I moved away from home. I got a new job, I'm still doing my best to work on this channel as often as I can, and frankly, it's difficult to put on the veil or persona of my more upbeat and usual self that you're probably more used to seeing or just being exposed to. It's been a long year, and I'm really tired. I'm always tired. I constantly worry about whether or not that's ever going to change. For as often as I saturate myself with the art of people like Phoebe Bridgers, Ethel Kane, Dan Barrett, Radiohead, Scott Hutchinson, or anyone who makes cathartic work that I find resonant, I think I've grown to appreciate and love things that manage to remind me of the unequivocal beauty of music, that give me experiences that transport me far away from here and stimulate my imagination in ways that invigorate and excite me, even if it serves as a temporary escape. I think that's supremely worthwhile. As of late, I can't think of anything that provides me the full-on escape, the luxurious and wonderful immersion that I've developed a craving for at this stage of my life quite like Hirasawa does. Even the records I would say are firmly mid-tier from him manage to make me feel that unknowable magic that's just so childlike and wonderful that once you get older you just convince yourself you're never going to feel it again until you encounter something that disproves your more cynical inclinations. That's not to say that there isn't sorrow or darkness in his music. I think it would be kind of selling him short if I implied that. There is, but it's never enough to weigh it down to the point where it will stop giving you that sense of wonder. 
I think the best example of what I mean is something that I couldn't not talk about considering what it means to me and a lot of other people. I'm not sure if I could designate this as my favorite thing he's made, because it feels almost pithy to designate it so definitively, but if there's one thing that embodies all this emotional crap I've been on about, it's Gut's theme from his work on the Berserk soundtrack. Berserk is a dark fantasy anime that, when you look at it on paper, feels like a weird match for the style of Hirasawa. On first glance, it's this high fantasy thing with all these tropes and signifiers that just don't feel like they would meld aesthetically with Hirasawa's very electronic, new age, synthy, prog pop style. However, when you become more familiar with it, when you hear it in that show, it really works. It manages to embody the rough edges, the things that make that story unique, to the point where I think no one could have matched that material better. This sedentary, new age ballad swells and ebbs with a vastness that you feel immediately lost in. The alien female vocal harmonies are disarming, and once Hirasawa himself becomes a vocal presence, the song feels like it's aching. It embodies loneliness when something minimal and faint would have done the trick for anyone else. It feels like it embodies the story, the pain that you find in something like Berserk, something that, if you're familiar with, you know is potent and overwhelming. Sometimes I just sit and listen to this song, find whatever nice view I can, and I just soak in what it is to feel alone in that moment. It's so small, so specific, but I can't get that feeling anywhere else. It manages to still hold the resilience that makes it feel affirming, but a comfort too that lets you know that you're properly understood. When Kentaro Miura, the man who wrote Berserk, died, I listened to this song and only really began to understand how complicated the feelings within it were. That set me on the path of discovering his music, but delayed my proper discovery months because I just couldn't pry myself away from this one piece. I still listen to it every once in a while. When I'm in that liminal state between sadness and determination, and it feels like the only music that matters when you're in the mood for it, that's the power of Hirasawa's music. And frankly, I would be a fool not to try and share its power to the best of my ability. Because sometimes things are too beautiful to ignore. <laughs>